Last week, the news media went ballistic after the owners of the Los Angeles Times and Washington Post blocked each paper's editorial boards from formally endorsing Kamala Harris for president. The Times editorial editor resigned in protest. Two other members of the editorial board followed her lead. Two Washington Post columnists resigned as well to signal their disapproval of the move and many readers from both publications have reportedly canceled their subscriptions in response. Journalists Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, who are famous for reporting on Watergate while working at the Washington Post, released a statement stating their disappointment. Former executive editor Martin Barron called the decision, quote, cowardice with democracy as its casualty. 19 Washington Post columnists signed an op-ed calling the lack of an endorsement a terrible mistake. And the unions of both publications released statements expressing their concern over such a move. Across the board, the cited concern is that we are just days away from a consequential election where one of the candidates poses a major threat to democracy itself. The rest of the media see the billionaires who own each outlet as preemptively self-censoring themselves to avoid offending Donald Trump. This self-censorship then, we're told, makes it more likely that Trump will get elected. The assumptions that underlie these concerns are worth unpacking. The first, and perhaps most foolish, notion is that an endorsement from the LA Times or Washington Post will be a consequential factor in this election. The audience of both papers already skews heavily Democrat. Also, it is no mystery to anyone who spends as little as 30 seconds scrolling through editorial headlines that the paper's editors support Harris over Trump, and why. A short look at the opinion and news stories in either paper is also enough to dispel the notion that either outlet's executives are worried about displeasing Trump. Even in the hard news sections, Trump is framed as an unhinged fascist set to destroy the country to nurse his fragile ego, while Harris is a serious, stern, problem-solving public servant who, at worst, has made a few tactical mistakes on the campaign trail. No honest observer can seriously say these papers are staying silent about this election. Above all, the intensity of the meltdown we're seeing from the media figures both inside and outside these two publications reveals how profoundly out of touch most of the establishment media is about their own importance. There was a time, mainly back in the mid to late 1800s, when the public got virtually all its news from newspapers. It's hard to overstate how much power that put in the hands of the printers and later editors and executives who produced these papers. As we go about our lives, we are constantly building and refining an internal model of reality that helps us better act to achieve our desired ends. Much of this model is fashioned from our own experience or the experience of our friends and family, which gets shared with us through advice and stories. To understand all parts of the world that exist outside the experience of ourselves and those we personally know, we rely on media. In the 19th century, the media consisted almost exclusively of books, pamphlets, and newspapers. Because our internal models of reality are indistinguishable from reality itself, and newspapers were effectively the sole source of information about current events, newspaper editors exerted an enormous amount of control over how the population saw the world. And their near monopoly over public discourse about current events gave them a lot of authority when it came to analyzing or endorsing the actions of politicians. As other forms of media gained traction, however, the dominance of newspapers began to wane. That started with magazines, the first truly national news outlets, and it really accelerated with the rise of radio and television news. But the high cost of starting a new publication and the government's early seizure of the airwaves kept control over the information space, mostly in the hands of a small, establishment-friendly group. That changed in the 1990s with the introduction of internet blogs. Suddenly, anyone with an internet connection could reach readers without filters, editors, or space constraints. It wasn't obvious at first, but with this one seemingly innocuous development, the establishment's monopoly on the information space was shattered forever. Now, three decades later, the consequences of such a change are much harder to ignore. From Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, and the campaigns of Ron Paul and later Donald Trump at home, to the Arab Spring and the passage of Brexit abroad, the internet has changed the world. Not only because it allowed people to see and hear dissenting views, but because it showed people that those views were popular. In an election this close, neither candidate has been able to ignore the new reality we find ourselves in. Both Harris and Trump have appeared on popular podcasts, with Trump making such appearances a central part of his campaign. Last week, Trump sat for a three-hour discussion on the Joe Rogan experience, which is technically the most watched talk show of any kind in the world, by far. 
Trump's appearance on Rogan has been viewed 40 million times on YouTube alone. Spotify and Apple Podcasts don't publish download numbers, but both also account for a large portion of Rogan's listenership. So the total number is likely much higher. The interview towers over Kamala Harris's recent interview with Fox News, which at 8 million viewers had been celebrated as the highest rated interview of the 2024 election. The internet is no longer a sideshow in our media environment. It's the main stage, which is why it's absurd to see an absolute meltdown over whether two newspapers print formal endorsements of one of the candidates. The panic can only be understood as a symptom of the legacy media being unable or unwilling to face the fact that they are no longer the main force influencing and controlling how the public sees the world. The establishment press does still pose a serious threat, with all the various ways they distort our perceptions of the truth in ways that are politically expedient for them and their friends in government. But the hysteria last week over the withdrawn editorial endorsements demonstrates that many are still hyper-focused on some media practices that today are largely irrelevant. And that's grounds for optimism.